Today we're discussing Shattered Empire by Greg Rucka. And stay tuned until the end when the Marvel series editor, Jordan D. White, will join me to answer some of your questions about the comics. The Star Wars Show Book Club is a series where we gather friends and fans to read Star Wars books, examining how they relate to all of the Star Wars films, live action shows, animated series, comics, and games. Through these stories, we enrich our understanding of the galaxy far, far away. Hello! Kristen Baber here, ready to talk Star Wars comics with a few new friends. Our story begins during the Battle of Endor near the finale of Star Wars Return of the Jedi and gives us a glimpse at what unfolds after the Ewoks' celebration. Palpatine may be gone, but he's deployed his dreaded messengers to execute Operation Cinder. And even though the Empire lost the fight, remnant cells continue to operate, forcing rebel heroes like Luke Skywalker, Leia Organa, Han Solo, and Lando Calrissian to soldier on. At the heart of the story is Shara Bay, a hotshot pilot who also happens to be the mother of Poe Dameron. Now let's meet our book club crew. Today we're joined by Will Slinney, an artist for Marvel Star Wars comics. We've also got Rob from Lucasfilm Publishing. And we also have Vanessa, best known as the voice of Hera on Star Wars Rebels. All right, let's jump right in. This series picks right up at a crucial moment at the end of one of the films, this time being Return of the Jedi. So I'm curious, were you surprised to see the way the comic reframed some aspects of the fight bringing Shara Bay into the fray and in close contact with Luke and Han and Leia and Lando and all these other great characters that we know and love from Star Wars Return of the Jedi? I was surprised that they didn't really win. <laughs> I thought Endor, <laughs> right? I thought Endor was it, and I, I thought it was mission accomplished. So it was interesting to see that you know sometimes we think we're finished with something, and no, there's still more to do. <laughs> One of my favorite things about Star Wars is that like if you just move the camera over a tiny little bit to the right, there's just a full new story there. And I love that scene where Han is running in to blow up the shield generator, and he just lobs the grenade to someone to his right, who you find out is Poe Dameron's father. And just you know, there's this whole world of stories that really exists just in the peripheral beyond the movies, and it's amazing that we get to see all of them now. Yeah, that was one of my favorite aspects of the opening of the comic as well, that, you know, as we get to see those initial moments after the Endor battle, we realize that that entire crowd that we see during the Ewok celebration, those are individual characters that we can now get to meet and learn things about and see what their struggles were as far as the way that the battle ended and what they did and didn't achieve. Palpatine is a man who's always had schemes on schemes on schemes on schemes, but why do you think in the story he chose to execute his post-mortem plan of Operation Cinder with these messengers that are essentially just these, you know, lifeless drones that happen to have his you know, head, his holographic head as, as part of their composition? Well, you know, the, the Palpatine we've met through all of the movies and all the storytelling, you know, was always a master puppeteer, master, master, you know, puppet master. And to see him carry that forward with these, you know, basically human-shaped marionettes, moving them around the galaxy, delivering, you know, just the most awful and, and vile messages, you know, it's, it's a nice counterpoint to Order 66, which was executed over a radio. And interestingly about The Messenger, for me, I remember reading that, this book when it came out and reading it again now after seeing the last movie, I have such a different feeling seeing that messenger, whereas before I thought it was just kind of a, a spiteful, oh, you've killed me, this is my plan. Whereas now it kind of seems to be leading into an actual longer term plan from Palpatine Cool. So it was cool to read it with two very, very different perspectives as well. I had the very same experience. I kept thinking, oh, this really foretells what is ahead, um, you know, um, I actually did ADR with a group of people for Rise of Skywalker and uh, we were all sitting around doing the when I <laughs> when I saw that messenger, I heard echoes of that because I thought, oh, he's somewhere and they're doing that. Ugh. Just scares me to death. <laughs> the other moment that I really loved uh, was when Princess Leia says, I feel cold. And there's this image of Darth Maul. I just thought that was so well done in the comic. I felt a chill reading it. Well, and I love that whole trip to Naboo where she has that connection to Padme and her heritage and her birth mother. I would like to open that up to the group though. What do you think the significance was of Leia feeling Maul's presence on the planet in that moment? Same kind of thing again, I have two different perspectives on it. Again, now that I know how powerful she was in the Force, really it's one of the first things apart from, you know, like one of the first things that we get to see her do as a Jedi is get those kind of feelings. And this is the first time like she's had a real connection with the past. And I was also really 
glad to see that the tradition of kick-ass queens of Naboo continues. <laughs> yes. When you look at Kess and Shara Bay, does it impact how you view the character of Poe Dameron on the films? I never put it together about the hair until you just said it there and it's totally right, actually. <laughs> I just read Resistance Reborn, which talks about his hair a lot. <laughs> so I feel like it's just fresh in my mind yeah. that he, he thinks about his quaff quite a bit. At the ending, I thought it was such a beautiful way to, you know, sort of bring this to a, a, a nice culmination where you see them as a couple together with the tree. And to me, that also told me a lot about where he came from. Yoshara is such a strong character and she has so many layers to it. You know, she just had a baby and then went right back onto the front lines and left Poe with her father. I found it so striking that, you know, she's being given the chance to have this quiet life with her family, but she's still so cooled by the fight. And her captain, I think it's uh, Lulo, you know, pretty much has to give her the nudge and file the paperwork for her and you know, give her the permission of it's okay to make time for yourself and to put yourself first for once and, you know, go have that quiet life. But it's so refreshing that the focus is on her as an individual and not just as a mother, not just as a wife, not even just really as a cog in the Rebel Alliance, but, you know, how all of those things are encompassed in this character. Yeah, I liked that. And I liked, again, that she's, you know, given the space, the physical and emotional space to, you know, explore that and make those decisions without Kess standing right next to her. You know, it's not that they're not making these decisions as partners, as parents, but you know, she's she's having to figure a lot of this out for what it means for her. To a certain degree, what you're seeing is the weird kind of echo to Han and Leia and Ben and how it goes not that well in so many ways. Maybe they should have stepped away from the war. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> it goes not that well, enter Kylo Ren. <laughs> Luke and Leia's individual missions were a great way of tying the original trilogy and the prequels and you know, bringing it together in this nice package in the lead up to the sequel trilogy, which is when this book was originally uh, published. What was your favorite part of the series? It was lovely to get to know new characters that foretold things in the future, but it was also really cool to see Lando and R2-D2 and even Akbar. Oh, hey, how you doing? Um, those those little little things delighted me. And I also, yeah, I really love how Greg put those little things and they're like, I'm gonna sleep so hard. Little things that are just so relatable. For me, I, I completely agree with how it, it took this uh, big, massive battle and brought it straight down to about this little family that just want to get home and raise their kid. Back in 2015, I read this, I didn't have a kid. Uh, whereas this time I read, I've got a little one-year-old son and it was just a completely different experience reading it. And there was a little scene in it when a stormtrooper pulls a gun on Kez. And I couldn't remember the outcome of the story because it had been five years, I guess, since I read it. And I didn't know if Kez was going to make it or not. Whereas before, the first time I read it, it would have been like, oh, I'm sure he'll be fine or whatever. Whereas this time, I was just really concerned for the kid not to lose a father or something. It's just a, you know, a fear that I have as a father. There's that moment of elation at the beginning that, you know, they're, they're all seeing that, oh, the war's over, we can actually step back. And then realizing eh, it's not actually over, you know, and how each of them has to deal with how much more they have to give to the cause. I, I, you know, that really, you know, sang to me as sort of a, you know, it's not a one and done kind of thing. Yeah, we blew up the Death Star, we blew it up twice. But, you know, it's, uh, <laughs> it, it's, it's, there's still work to be done. You know, it, it Hold on to your hats, here comes Starkiller Base. <laughs> yeah, here comes Starkiller Base. <laughs> For me, I also just really loved how it shifted some of how I saw some characters that I've known and loved for years and years. You know, Leia, you see her in a slightly different position in the story in that moment where she's writing letters to inform the families of some of her soldiers who have died. It just, I felt something different seeing her write those letters. And also I thought it says so much about the person that the Organa has raised, that she doesn't want a protocol droid to help her. She wants to handwrite everything and, you know, give it, imbue it with all that emotion that's genuine and authentic to her. Can you imagine C-3PO writing one of those? <laughs> it wouldn't go down very oh well. <laughs> Don't you call me a mindless philosopher, you overweight glob of grease. Will, I feel like you brought a show and tell today. Oh, the <laughs> arts? Terrible segue, yeah, yeah. did you? Yes. 
Yeah, I really wanted to draw a picture of Shara after reading the whole thing. But she was such a great character. There's a lot of personality to her, which is always a kind of a fun thing to try and do when you're drawing. But it's always fun to do your first take on a Star Wars character that you haven't drawn before. The rest of us didn't bring anything for show and tell, but that's okay. <laughs> yeah. I've, got, I've got a little strong trooper. Nice. I have new wall art. Oh, are we getting I our do. toys? No, no, well, I do have my episode uh -oh. seven hat. Oh. which I can't very well place over my buns. Oh, oh, very cool, Will. Oh, I envy you so much. Well, thank you so much for sharing your opinions and your toys and your drawings. <laughs> this has been an awesome conversation, all about Shattered Empire, and I so appreciate all of you taking the time. And now we're joined by Jordan D. White, a senior editor at Marvel, who also edited Shattered Empire and many other Star Wars books. Hi, how's it going? Good, how are you? Very good. Thank you for having me. Thank you for joining us. We have a lot of good questions. Daryl Cooper wants to know, was it daunting telling a story about Luke after Return of the Jedi when nothing was yet known about the sequel trilogy? No, it was incredibly thrilling to be able to say, we are going to actually show what happened next right after that that adventure that we've all seen a million times. It was it was so neat. Um, the fact that we get you know, more adventures on Endor for a minute there, we got to go back to Naboo, and Luke in particular, Seeing him come into his own as a Jedi, uh, or having come into his own as a Jedi, and what he does next, and setting that off, the, the, the seeking out the, the, the tree saplings. Uh, mm. So, so interesting and so exciting and such cool ideas that, that Greg brought to it about what Luke would need to do next. And um, yeah, I was really thrilled. From Star Wars Show Book Club super fan Conja Chris. What is it like creating a story that fills in some gaps between Return of the Jedi and The Force Awakens? How much of the story and characters do you get to create yourself, and how much is already given to you for continuity's sake? Or is it more of a collaboration? It's definitely a very much a collaboration. You know, we always have worked closely with Story Group uh, on every story that we did together. Um, most of the time, we would come up with the story and and go to them and say here's what we'd like to do and then they would come back to us with their notes about how and why it can work or what needs to change in order to make it fit with other plans and if yes if we if we went too far and said so at this point you know luke gets cut in half they would say to us no 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 that that can't happen <laughs> <laughs> but generally speaking uh they've always been very receptive to what we want to tell a story about. We get to see a very tranquil and mature Luke in, you know, in the final issue. How did the creative team behind the comic really bring that Luke to life? Well, I mean, I think a lot of that comes from his portrayal in Return of the Jedi, like over the whole film. But, you know, when he shows up in Jabba's palace, he feels so different from the last time we saw him. You know, the, the Luke that is training on Dagobah in Empire he still feels really young. He still feels inexperienced, even though he's already a hero of the rebellion and he's he's already a, a leader in the rebellion. Arguably, he single-handedly blew up the Death Star. <laughs> well, <laughs> he know? definitely did that. You know, he felt different, and again, that's why right now them exploring what happened to him between Empire and Jedi, which is a shorter period of time than between New Hope and Empire, even. That's going to be a really interesting story to read about in the main Star Wars book. Um, but I think we took our cues from it, from the film. It's just how different he feels. And then I think he does have that real peace at the end because he knows yeah. he was right about his father. He didn't have to kill him, even though unfortunately he did die. He, he knows though that he kind of lives on in spirit. He saw that, that truth. That's probably like the peak of his confidence and most assuredness at that point. Yeah. So it strikes me also that a lot of people who work on Star Wars today, because the franchise is more than 40 years old, grew up as fans first. Does your favorite part as the editor differ from your favorite part as just a, a reader and fan? Um, that's a great question. And it's very interesting because, yeah, the, what is the divide between between me as a fan and as a professional who worked on them. It, it's a tough call. Because honestly, I so I, I, like you said, I grew up on Star Wars, but I am, I think I'm much more of a Star Wars fan now, having worked on it than I was before. Yeah. Um, working on the stories made me love them even more. So 
so now when I enjoy Star Wars, because I because I no longer work on Star Wars books, now when I when I enjoy Star Wars stuff, it is purely as a fan. But that love is is so deepened by having worked on. Well, thank you so much for joining us today, Jordan. We really appreciate it. Thank you for having me. Thanks to all of you who joined in from home, sent in your questions, and watched along. Come back next week when the Star Wars Show Book Club returns to dig into the legends of Luke Skywalker by Ken Liu. And don't forget to tweet your questions using hashtag SWSBC Legends, and we'll ask some on the show. Until then, may the Force be with you.